This morning, we're just delighted to welcome uh, Professor Charles Clark um, to speak about the challenges to the eradication of poverty in the 21st century, um, using insights from Catholic social thought. Professor Clark is Senior Fellow of the Vincentian Center for Church and Society and Professor of Economics at St. John's University in New York. He earned a BA from Fordham University and a PhD from the New School for Social Research. Dr. Clark has published widely on economics and Catholic social thought, the history of economic thought, inequality, and poverty. And he's well placed at a morning session for his wonderful sense of humor. So I know we'll all be alert and awake and laughing. Professor Clark, thank you. I actually never tell jokes. I'm always serious. <laughs> just the reality is so absurd, it just sounds funny. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for uh, the kind introduction. Uh, an early economics lecture for theologians is as close as we get to redemptive suffering. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully you'll get something out of it and, besides time off in purgatory. Uh, very nice to be here uh, at Notre Dame. Uh, it's a very lovely room. Uh, particularly want to uh, say how glad I am to be at Notre Dame because one of the biggest influences on my work was Professor Charles Wilbur, who taught economics here for a long time. Uh, and I had read his work as a graduate student on methodology, uh, but it was when Economic Justice for All came out the U.S. bishops put out a series of videos. Uh, and I remember him being in one. I was, went with my mother to my uh, uh, local parish and gave me a sense that you could do something in economics that uh, was in line with the mission, that the economists weren't the, didn't have to be the opposing faith or, or the evil art. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here. And, uh, uh, and I hope he's doing well now in, in his retirement. Gives us hope also in retirement. <laughs> okay, what I'm gonna talk about is actually uh, a hopeful story. Uh, and what I think is one of the successes uh, of Catholic social thought, not that Catholic social thought was uh, caused what the change in how we think about uh, poverty and development, but it certainly played a role, and it played an early role in, in promoting a wider understanding of not just poverty, but of humans as economic actors. Okay, so I'm gonna talk briefly about what Catholic social thought brings to understanding the economy. Uh, I have a little tweet that sums up actually the whole presentation. <laughs> So we just tweet it out, call it a day. You know. uh, then I'm gonna go over how economists have looked at poverty and some of the limitations in, in that. Uh, and that's what Catholic social thought I think helps to uh, fix. Uh, but mostly economists look at e poverty as a problem of not enough economic growth. And so if we just get enough economic growth, all problems are solved. And so then I'll look a little at why that hasn't worked and what economists are missing. And then I'm gonna look at the, the hopeful signs and that is some of the new directions in anti-poverty programs, particularly uh, development programs that are much more in line with Catholic social thought than they are with the traditional way economists look at the world. Uh, I'd like to start off with uh, to make it clear that Catholic social thought is not an alternative economic theory, it's not an alternative economic system. There is not a Catholic monetary policy. Uh, Catholics could disagree on economic policy. Uh, and economic policy is very much contingent, as John Paul uh, frequently mentioned, on time and space, that is on the context there isn't one economic policy that will work at all times in all places. And there isn't one economic theory that will explain all times at all places. 
And so this idea that we have policies that might work in the United States and we can just impose them on other countries and they'll become just like us uh, is not only arrogant, it's just not accurate. Uh, and so what Catholic social thought does is it gives us a different vision of the human person. Uh, all economic theories, all social theories are based on a vision uh, and this one, uh, Catholic social thought, uh, provides a broader understanding of what it means to be human, what is society, and what is the purpose uh, of humans. Uh, and the Catholic social thought also provides a criteria for evaluating outcomes, which is very important. But I've, I've used this table a lot in my publications and presentations. As I said, all social theory is based on a vision. So the theories do not answer the question, what does it mean to be human? What is society? What is the good we strive for? Economists aren't equipped to do that. This is something that uh, John Henry Newman pointed out uh, over 100 years ago. You have to go to a different source. You have to go, as he said, to the higher sciences of philosophy and theology to be able to answer those questions. But in economics, we have the rational economic man, sometimes known as homo economicus. And that completely shapes most uh, economists' view of just about everything. Uh, it's often defended as, well, it's a simplification that allows us to look at things a little more clearly with a little more rigor. Uh, and that's true, but, but when you get to actually actual problems, uh, the majority of economists can't get beyond this understanding of the human person. If we want to understand humans, we have to understand, well, what are their costs, what are their benefits? What are they maximizing, what are they minimizing? Uh, they are rational actors who are seeking utility. We just have to figure out how they understand cost and benefits, and then we can explain individual outcome. And very important is that our method of understanding is methodological individualism. That is, no explanation is finished or satisfactory unless it's in terms of individuals making choices, uh, which means you can't have social explanations or aggregate explanations. Everything comes down to, well, individuals chose X, and this is why we end up with Y. And this flows directly from their understanding of the human person so that poverty becomes just a series of choices. It's just the outcome of bad choices. One economist has called it the flawed character theory, uh, and it's a very good way of blaming the poor uh, for their situation. Now, if we take what would probably be the opposite of neoclassical economics, Marxian economics, they have a completely opposite view of the human person. Marx famously said, man is the totality of social relations. Uh, all the factors on us make who we are. And so there you'll have a more organic instead of a mechanical view of society. Uh, and there, poverty will be a structural problem. There are structures that cause. And those structures could be policies. It could be, for Marx, it certainly would go back down to property relations. Uh, but if you want to fix the problem, you have to change the structures. Whereas Catholic social thought's view of the human person uh, is a, a broader view, which includes both we are unique individuals, but we have an inherent social nature. So we are not one or the other, we are both, which is, you know, if you're taking your final exam in theology, just put not one or the other or both, and you'll probably get most answers right. Professors say, oh, that's so profound, and they'll give you, trust me, they'll give you a good grade on it. Uh, so that uh, when we look at poverty, it's not just an income measure. Uh, poverty is multidimensional. It's social, political, spiritual, as well as material. Now, and of course, economists deal with the material aspects, but we have to understand that you can't separate the material from all the other factors that are at play here. Now, I'll give you an example. During the Jubilee year, uh, we had a lot of activities on uh, the, the debt forgiveness uh, movement that was going on that John Paul II and Bono seemed to be running. And 
So I propose that we could do a year of bake sales uh, and raise up enough money so we can buy one bond of one of the countries that uh, is particularly distressed. We should be able to get it for two, three cents on the dollar. So if we could raise $10,000, and if they just sell the cookies to me, they probably would reach that, uh, then we could then buy a bond and we can have the ambassador of that country come to the campus and our students can say, we have forgiven this and hand it to them. I thought it was a great idea. Uh, and I, I, but I couldn't f figure out the mechanics. So I teach in a business school. So I, I asked almost every economist, every finance professor, how would you do this? And they all agreed, yes, you could do it, but why would you? Uh, and the most common thing is, well, once you held the, had the bond, you should hold on to it, because these countries are going to get bailed out, and you'll get paid, you know, 50 cents on the dollar, and you would have paid two cents on the dollar. In fact, we would have been taking an option on the poor instead of an option for the poor. But they couldn't think in a different way, and it's because they are trained to think this, this way in terms of rationally economic actors, markets rationally allocate resources, and that's the best outcome that we could hope for. Okay, so I think when John Paul II called for a new and deeper reflection on the nature of the economy, what he's really calling for is we have this rich understanding of the human person and that we should then re-ask all the economic questions based on this broader view of the human person. Okay, so Catholics also thought, besides prioritizing the poor and the marginalist, asks us to go beyond. Of course, it, we start with the poor and the marginalized should be our primary concern. Uh, but you know, I've been to many pr presentations by Catholic and Christian economists who say, you know, how do we live our faith? Well, we apply neoclassical economic theory to solving problems to help the poor. And Sometimes you can do very good work with that, but you're always going to be limited because you're still conceptualizing everything uh, in the logic that markets are the best way or the only way to solve the problem and that it's individual decisions that you have to change. Now, often you do make this change individual choice, but you also, to do that, you have to change the range of choices people have. Uh, and so the assumption that everyone has uh, white middle class choices and they just chose badly. Uh, I was at one meeting where an economist said, well the problem with food stamps benefits running out early in the month is because the poor, like a lot of us, have a hard time with their time preference. You know, they're just valuing now more than they are at the end of the month and so they spend the money too quickly. And he recommended that they have food stamp cards that give only a certain amount each week, so in the fourth week they would have one-fourth of their benefits. The idea that the benefits are inadequate to provide food for the month it was just outside of his conception. Uh, you know, so if we can just treat people like you know, our pet gerbil and just give them a little food at a time, we can make better choices. Well, there's a long tradition in economics of doing that, that the problem is the poor make poor decisions, we have to make those decisions for them. But as I, but as I, I believe, Catholic social thought asks us for a broader understanding of poverty, and particularly what John Paul has emphasized, is that poverty and inequality is exclusion. Uh, and that exclusion is, the, is the, getting rid of the barriers that exclude and building pathways so that we can include people to build up their capacities to open up uh, not only our conversations, but uh, open up economic relations so that they can participate, that that is the, the only path forward because it's raising up the development of people instead of just, we're gonna produce more output in your country so per capita income is going to go up. Uh, participation is a big factor, a very important factor in Catholic social thought because it's humans playing a major role in their lives. Uh, I think John Paul II said to be, you know, the lead protagonist in your 
story or you know, he has an acting background. Uh, but the, you know, it's not just giving people enough so that they have, that, so they're not hungry, that they have adequate housing. All that is important, but that, that they are uh, agents in their own lives. Uh, that's as important. And that exclusion is inefficient for society as a whole. We are all poorer because the poor are excluded. Now, there was a recent study that, that said that that concluded that genius is randomly spread across the population. Well, if that's true, well, we have, you know, billions of people who are just taken out of the equation. You know, so the person who could have cured a lot of diseases never had the opportunity to even get an education. Uh, I once worked in a factory uh, on assembly line next to an older, African-American man who was in his 60s, I was, I think, 17 or 18. Uh, he had a second grade uh, education, uh, and we spent the whole time when we were on the same line together, it was about a month, talking about Plato. Uh, and the, it was very clear that he was the person who should be at Fordham uh, studying philosophy instead of me, because he was, he, he had a great brain, he had deep insights, uh, but he, would, he had no opportunity growing up in Louisiana uh, when he did. Uh, and this, everyone is poor because of that. Okay, now economics had a brief period where it looked like they were gonna solve the economic problem and raise everyone above poverty. From 1750 to 1800, the two great economists, Anne Robert Jacques Turgot, the French economist, and Adam Smith, had this idea of universal progress, that it is possible to raise the standard of living of everyone, and that this progress extends to society, cultural progress, besides technological uh, and material progress. And of course, Adam Smith wrote a whole book, Turgot didn't produce as much, but he wrote a whole book explaining how if we had, if we got rid of the barriers, which for him the barriers were the mercantile policies where the government gave preferences to businesses who had political connections that, and allowed everyone to compete in a market that the great inequality that existed would decrease uh, and that everyone, the vast majority of whom were poor, would be lifted up. And you know, Adam Smith uh, in, in The Wealth of Nations writes, no society surely can be flourishing and happy of which the greater part of its members are poor and miserable. Uh, and so, you know, it's often pointed out, Smith has this great optimism of what could be achieved. So this, what he called society of perfect liberty, but free market capitalism is what we probably would call uh, the Enlightenment felt that this would bring both prosperity and equality. And that was uh, the hope and the expectations. But of course then the Industrial Revolution hits. Uh, as Werner Stark wrote, the bourgeois ideal runs into capitalist reality and inequality greatly increases, uh, partly because of the need for capital intensity in this new mode of production in which you would have a smaller and smaller number of people owning the, those means of production. So the optimism ends around 1800, or 1799, when Thomas Robert Malthus writes his essay on the principle of population. Uh, he was actually arguing with his father about the perfectibility of, of mankind, uh, and he argued that we could never eliminate poverty because every time there's an increase in output, particularly an increase in food, the poor will procreate to eat that food so that the per capita amount of food will not go up. Uh, technically, if per capita food goes up, you can have more people leave the farm, go into manufacturing, and that's the growth process that Adam Smith uh, and others were talking about. Malthus offered two solutions, one of which was you could convince the poor to have less children. He thought there should be a lecture when they got married, only have two children. Uh, so a little moral 
uh, restraint will solve the problem. But if that doesn't work, then we have to find other ways to encourage uh, or prevent the expansion of the population. Uh, and these are direct quotes. So instead of recommending cleanliness to the poor, we should encourage contrary habits. Uh, we should build uh, and crowd more people into houses and court the return of the plague. We should build villages near stagnant pools so that we get more malaria. Uh, and mostly we should stop those benevolent but much mistaken men who are going out and curing diseases because uh, this is preventing this natural check. And in the classical economics of Malthus and Ricardo, the growth in population eats up the money that would go into investment that would allow for capital accumulation. So the poor were preventing the rest of society from industrializing and, be, and growing into a great empire. How do you solve this? Well, John Stuart Mills and the British government uh, thought, well, a good way is just start exporting poor people to all these colonies you just started. You know? So if you just get them out there, then the per capita income will naturally go up. I was once at a conference, it's actually the first UN event I ever went to, uh, and someone was, an economist was giving a speech on, on the effect AIDS was going to have on Africa, and at one point she said, AIDS is going to increase the per capita income in Africa. And, and matter of fact, and then just went on, I raised my hand in the back and I said, excuse me, could you explain how AIDS is going to raise the per capita income in Africa? And it's, well, it's simple. And she writes out the equation, because per capita income is output divided by population. And because she doesn't have to say that population is gonna go down because of AIDS. Everyone knows it's gonna go down because of AIDS. But that was, she proved her point. <laughs> And then she started going, I raised my hand again, and I said, wait, wait, don't you think that the people dying from AIDS, which are mostly then uh, young adults, are a major part of your productive population, and the people who are being left are the grandparents and children who aren't your most productive population, that there might be an output effect. Uh, but economists wouldn't think of an output effect necessarily because you know, output takes care of itself. The market will give you full production, full employment. Uh, so this is sort of the natural way of looking at things uh, once you give people a PhD in economics. Um, it's not that bad, but it's, it can be. But in the 20th century, we find a great success story in that the, the uh, European, North American, uh, the countries were part of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the top 20, 25 countries, uh, created societies in which the poverty was a minority. You know, we have a majority, middle class majority society. So economic growth and this thing called the welfare state did a tremendous job of dramatically reducing poverty in these countries uh, post-World War II. And so the great insight was, well, we just need to promote economic growth in uh, poor countries and as well as promote it at home as a way to reduce poverty that lingers in all the rich countries, particularly the English-speaking rich countries. Uh, also, economic growth was the solution to the rising pollution and environmental concerns from the 1960s and 70s. Uh, you might think that economic growth is causing the pollution, and that might be true, but as people get richer, they value cleaner air more. And at some income lev level, they are willing to pay for cleaner air. So if we just get everyone up to that level, then we can start having a cleaner environment. People will make, choose clean air over polluted air, clean water over polluted water. We just, it's a normal good, we just have to find the income level to get them there and then we, pollution will take care of itself. So, for the mainstream of economists, every issue is a nail and economic growth is the hammer. Uh, John Kenneth Galbraith's greatest book, I would say one of the greatest books of the 20th century, The Affluent Society, uh, goes, the main theme is how 
this push on economic growth when you've already solved the economic problem is very much because it's most profitable, it's the most profitable policy for those who are already rich. You know, the owners of uh, companies will get the benefits, just keeping economic growth growing uh, is necessary for multinational corporations to maintain their status and power. Uh, but the Harvard economist Benjamin Friedman recently wrote a book, The Moral Case for Growth. Uh, with climate change, the case for growth has gotten significantly weaker. So instead of saying this will raise people's standard of living, it will make us more tolerant. It will promote social mobility. We'll be dedicated to democracy. And we can see that democracy is really doing well in the rich countries right now. So good job, Mr. Friedman. But, but this is the economic lessons part of, of the lecture. So most economists look at economic growth from what is the solo growth model which is you have savings, and the idea is savings comes from people not consuming, but in reality, savings comes from people who can meet their basic needs and have a surplus over that. So the way you increase savings in a society is to increase income inequality. This is supply side economics, trickle down economics. Give the money to the rich, they'll invest it, and then we'll have economic growth, and that will allow everything else to improve. Now, for poor countries who don't have sufficient income for savings, the case is, well, then foreign direct investment will do that. So that's FDI. So large companies will invest in these areas, and that will be just as if they had saved and invested. The key is that that investment is all guided by the marketplace that you need a capital-friendly environment to encourage the private sector to come in and invest in these countries. If the public sector invests, they'll do it for political reasons, and so the money will not be used most efficiently. But the private sector will use it in what will produce the most profits, and that is pr practically the definition that we would use, or certainly the operable definition we would use for efficiency in economics. To promote this, the World Bank and the IMF instituted, particularly in countries that had economic problems, usually balance of payment problems or debt problems, uh, is they instituted structural adjustment programs, and these were policies to force capital-friendly uh, environment. The idea is what you need is free flow of capital into the country and free flow out so that you'll encourage money to come in and it will be used most efficiently. Of course, this also meant that you had to promote austerity with the, with the budget, cut government spending. Particularly in Africa in the 70s and 80s, it was cutting education and healthcare spending so that they could better pay back debts that had been borrowed by crazy dictators uh, in the name of extremely poor people. This, of course, didn't work. I mean, the, you could find in the literature the 70s being called the lost decade of development for Africa. You can find articles on the 80s being the lost dec decade for Africa. And if you're halfway through the 90s, you will find people writing about the 90s being another lost decade of development for Africa. So just encouraging investment in a way that makes it capital friendly uh, was not a successful strategy. Partly because you were cutting your investment in people. Uh, and as I like to say, sick and stupid is not a good development strategy. You know, investing in people, giving them health and education is a much more successful way to raise the standards of living, just in pure economics, but in terms of social progress, uh, it's even more obvious. Often capital friendly meant it's easy to avoid taxes. Uh, and it's pretty universal that countries who give aid get a lot more out of the countries they give aid to than they give in aid. I, an extreme example, I was on a panel in Ireland and an accounting professor had done some research on Malawi. And Ireland has a close relationship with Malawi and they had uh, given eight million euro uh, a couple of years before to Malawi on different development projects. And you know, if Ireland's not a big country, this is a big contribution for them. Uh, 
And then she pointed out through one tax treaty that Ireland has with Malawi, uh, they allowed a South African mining company, which had an office in Dublin, to book all their profits through that office and avoid 140 million in taxes they would have paid to the Malawi government. The Malawi government doesn't need Ireland's $8 million. They need the 140 million uh, taxes that should have been paid for mining in their country. It is not uncommon for multinationals to have a negative tax uh, operating in Africa. That is, they'll have a tax, let's say, of a uh, million dollars, but they get rebates of 10 million from the government. Uh, often this is done, they're given free energy because the energy bill is bigger than what they contribute uh, in taxes. The Yankees have the same deal in New York City, but <laughs> New Yorkers can afford it. But, but another problem I, I would argue is increasingly becoming understood is that what we think of as capital is just too narrow. Now, in economics, Economic growth and capital accumulation are the same thing. You know, you, you would see books on theory of capital accumulation. That's a book about growth theory. But if you reduce capital to just finance capital or manufactured capital, tools, machines, buildings, uh, you're missing what you need to invest in to have a productive society. And so it's becoming much more common to talk about the five capitals to include not only human capital, which most economists are, have accepted and are, is part of the, the mainstream discussions on economic growth, but also natural capital fully uh, measured. That is, not just the monetary value of resources that you extract, but the effect that you have on the environment. So adding in the cost, the externalities, of what and how you uh, uh, extract resources from the environment. But social capital is as important, if not more important, for a sustainable and growing uh, society and economy. So investing in communities, investing in you know, honest government, these are more important than building another hydroelectric dam. Uh, and even now, the, the, the World Bank is coming out and uh, arguing that we have to take a broader look, because capital is what we're going to invest in. And what are we going to invest in? Well, we want a full range of what we need, even if it's something that we can't measure the benefit. You know, we know that raising children is a huge benefit to society. We're not going to measure the, the monetary benefit or the monetary cost of that accurately, and we're not going to be able to say, well, we're spending too much on good parenting and not enough, and we can see, we've got an equation here that shows us that, but we know that's very important. Uh, and so that has to be part of the discussion, uh, and that's at a much broad level of all sorts of social networks uh, that and, and things that encourage trust that make economic activity possible. So here we have, from 1820 to 1992, sort of the era of economic growth will solve everything, uh, the UNDP, United Nations Development Program, what they did is they took the per capita income of the five richest countries and compared it with the five poorest countries in those years. And so it, we can see that the gap uh, kept on increasing, uh, and it's sort of ironic that the main conclusion of the solo growth model, and I spared you the equation. I had it in an earlier draft, and then I said, nah, Notre Dame has suffered enough. <laughs> you know, and I'm sorry the football team didn't win the national championship. I really am. Uh, but uh, that, the, the, the central conclusion of Sol's growth model is that there will be convergence between the rich and poor countries. So following this path is the best way to bring the rich and poor worlds to a similar, if not eventually, the same per capita income. And so obviously that did not happen. Now the World Bank, as I said, they've been moving more and more towards this idea of uh, broader measures of wealth and capital, and here we have the rich countries, their total wealth per capita, and most of that is human investments in human resources. 
Certainly, their investment in plant and equipment is important, but you know, the main reason why these countries are rich and these countries are poor is investment in people. And it's, uh, this has become a major theme starting in the late 90s, early 2000s uh, for the, the World Bank and for the UN system. Okay, now a big change in this way of thinking, sort of a turning point, comes with Paul VI, where he talks about integral human development. And first time I went to the uh, UN mission uh, in New York, for the Holy See mission at, at the United Nations, uh, I was given sort of a history of the presentation that they made to the UN on Paul VI's uh, Popularium Progressio. Now, Certainly the thinking moved that way. It took a long time, uh, but uh, they were one of the early voices and a consistent voice at the United Nations pushing this broader measure of development and human progress. Uh, and the emphasis that instead of just promoting economic growth and hoping that it trickled down to solve all our social problems, that we need to address the issues that impact how people live first. And so after three very unsuccessful decades of development, the United Nations has decades of everything, but they had three decades of the development, 60s, 70s, and 80s, the developing countries, as they became independent in the 60s, uh, started to become much more assertive that these promote foreign trade, promote easy access to foreign uh, investment is not working. Uh, and by the way, I think they thought they should have a voice in what is policies for them. I once sat in on a meeting where they're working on the language on the new Africa program. The United Nations has this new Africa program is being renewed. Uh, and I was there as an observer, take notes for the mission, and you had the South African representative on the left, and then the United States, Japan, the European Union, who think they're a country, uh, and Switzerland. And the United States and the European Union were just badgering the South African representative on the problems of illicit funds leaving Africa. Uh, Japan just kept on saying, well, our mission agrees with the United States. And the Swiss kept on saying, we need to work on the grammar on this statement. <laughs> Every meeting I've gone to on, uh, on working on the wording, the Swiss are like the grammar police of the United Nations. Someone has to do it, you know, so. But when, when the meeting broke up, I went up to the South African and I said, you know, the illicit funds, the legal funds leaving Africa are far greater than the illegal funds. <laughs> you know, this is, a, this is like an absurd discussion to have. There are problems with drugs, drug money, gu illegal gun trades, human trafficking in Europe and the United States. That's not part of any official document, but it has to be highlighted in this program for Africa. And we're not going to talk about the real problem. Uh, and he just looked at me like, well, <laughs> that's, that's the reality. So in 1986, the developing countries pushed forward the declaration that development is a right. And I've seen once that challenged, and it created a real firestorm. I mean, generally the UN is as calm as you could be, you know. But, you know, the, the Japanese ambassador says, well, why do we have the right to development in this document? And like, every hand went up to, to, to try to explain to him why. Well, because it's, it is the official policy. And whenever there's an initiative that doesn't include the eradication of poverty, you just wait a week. <laughs> you come back for the next meeting, it's going to be there. Because some missions are going to say, this is not acceptable. We're not talking about the green economy unless it's in context of the eradication of poverty. We're not talking about this unless it's in the context of so they really changed the, the framework of how not only development, development became the eradication of poverty, uh, but also how we understand poverty. First with the UN Human Development Index, which is very crude, they look at three factors, 
Uh, but two of those factors were never included, health and education. Uh, and then we had what are now, we're now in the second year of the third decade, UN decade for the eradication of poverty. Uh, every year there's a report on the progress of that. Uh, I get it sent to me. <laughs> I have to write a summary of it. Uh, and uh, the UN has no power, they have very little resources, uh, but by persistently arguing the case, not only that poverty is a primary goal that has to be part of everything we do, but also how we understand poverty, how we're gonna address it, not as a trickle down, but directly uh, for, for two decades has impact scholars and poverty researchers and now public policy. So eventually we get the Millennium Development Goals, which set eight goals, uh, with uh, a great deal of pressure, first to try to understand those goals and measure them, but also to try to achieve the targets, uh, very much focusing what the World Bank and the IMF are doing uh, with their resources. And of course, for economists, it's like the greatest thing because it's the unlimited amount of data that's being generated. The Sustainable Development Goals, there's 17 goals, but there are like 267 targets, uh, indicators, and many of these have multiple indicators. So it's a data-rich environment for uh, social scientists to understand things. But the thing is that the, the important thing is when governments have to measure things, then it becomes a priority. It's something that we're measuring it for a reason, you know, because we want to have an impact on it. So I'm gonna go over some of these, what I think are, are really exciting developments. And one is this multi-dimensional poverty index. So the poverty, instead of just being a $1.90 a day uh, threshold, or in European countries, 60% of mean income. In the United States, we have a poverty index, uh, official poverty rate that's based on an agricultural budget from the 1950s, adjusted for inflation. It's a ridiculous measure. I've never seen anyone defend it, but no one's changing it. Uh, but here, this captures really what are the deprivations that make poverty so, so powerful a barrier to uh, human development. And there's been an explosion in alternatives to GDP. In fact, it's now just called Beyond GDP. Uh, as the literature. One of the earliest was the Genuine Progress Indicator, which took GDP and then subtracted all the cost of pollution, the cost to, to lost uh, leisure because of commuting, increased commuting, the, all sorts of social costs. Uh, but, a, but the main thing now is just using all the various different social health uh, as well as economic indicators to create different measures of progress. One is by Michael Porter, the business, famous business professor, called the uh, Social Progress Index. Uh, this one is the World Happiness Index, uh, which is based on Richard Eastland's research. And almost all of them show the same thing, that up until around 30 or $40,000 per capita income, there is a strong connection between social progress and GDP, although for happiness, the R square is 0.4277, so it's a little under half of what's going on is being, uh, can be explained with rise in income, so this half is not being explained. But once you're beyond that, then the lines flatten out. In some cases, they actually go down in some of the indices uh, that people, the average well-being in societies with very high incomes are lower than those who are, are less high. Now, part of that is there is also just a huge inaccuracy in how gross domestic product is measured. In, 19, in 2015, Ireland's GDP grew by 25.6%. That's impossible. <laughs> Unless you are the tax dodge uh, capital of the planet, 
Uh, and like the, the South African mining company, there is an empty office in Dublin uh, where Apple books all of their profits and pay 2% tax on all their profits. Uh, they just got fined 35 billion for that uh, by the EU courts, um, but that office owns all their patents, so all their divisions pay to, for the use of their patents. It's a way for them to avoid taxes. Uh, but uh, so that Luxembourg and a lot of these countries with really high per capita GDP, that's really not expressing all that much except that a lot of money is being booked through their system because they're, they allow for tax avoidance uh, from other areas. But even if you took out the last two, it flattens out. And this has been noticed since really the 70s uh, in Eastland's early research on happiness when we when Gallup started doing these happiness surveys in the in the I think the early 60s. Another uh, push in development is expanding social protection, as opposed to well let's just let the market take care of it. Uh, the, the idea that people who have to, who don't have to worry about the extreme risks that they're always in. If they have secure food, they don't have to worry about health care. If they don't have to worry about whether they're going to get a job in the short run, uh, this gives them the freedom, as well as lowering their illness, because the stress from all these makes you sick, uh, to start businesses, to get more education. Uh, to move to a different occupation where the prospects are better. Uh, and so countries that have expanded social protections in the developing world have seen considerably good results. Uh, I've done a lot of research, particularly in the Irish context, on basic income systems, which is a guaranteed income uh, as a replacement for welfare payments. And I wrote part of the Irish government's green paper uh, on this uh, which I think they finally posted in around 2001, 2002, somewhere around there. I did in 99. Uh, and people would ask me, well, how would this work in a developing context? And I always said, oh, I don't see how this could possibly work in a poor country. This is what rich countries should do to allow uh, for this new economy with the problems of technological change, et cetera. Uh, and I was completely wrong. You know, They've been very successful. Brazil had a very successful program and cut poverty in half. Mexico had a program where you got a family grant as long as the children went to school. So there's an, the criteria was they had, couldn't miss too many classes and they had to go for a checkup either once or twice a year. These are not harsh conditions. Uh, this is not like you know, the US government saying if you want food stamps you have to uh, work for them have work fair for, for food stamps. Now this is unconditional, do it whatever you want as long as your kids are in school uh, and seeing a doctor uh, twice a year. Uh, and these have been very successful. And one of the biggest successes is in new, new business formations. Uh, and so in Africa they are looking at these, we have experiments running, but they're also looking at uh, old age grants so that people a certain age will get sort of something like our social security. Uh, and of course all of Europe has child benefits. And so they're looking how can we expand child benefits as a way to get children out of poverty and that would raise also the households. And so the last couple of years at the UN, a large percentage of the they call side events during the, the meetings are on uh, case studies of these new social protection programs. And of course, uh, the best way to help poor countries is to stop stealing from them. <laughs> it's, it's, I don't know where I came up with this idea. Uh, must have been the drugs in the 60s. Because <laughs> I lived in the 60s, but I was 10 when they ended, so I guess I can't say, can't blame Woodstock for everything. Ah, uh, you could try. But uh, when, when Benedict said charity goes beyond justice, 
Uh, that really helped me reframe whenever I talk about uh, poverty, particularly in a development context. Uh, a lot of the debate is countries should give more aid, and, and we should do more for this, we do, should do more for that. And I always try to contribute, we should stop doing things. And, and then we can look at what we could do after we stop doing the bad things. So the chart on your right looks at net transfer of financial resources from the south to the north. And almost all those lines are, spend most of the time under zero, which means poor countries subsidize the living, standard of living in rich countries. This should not surprise us. This is colonialism. <laughs> this is why we took over those countries, so we can steal the resources and enslave their populations. Not because we thought, well, in 200 years, this would really help them. Because <laughs> in 200 years, we'll still continue owning them. So when the independent countries became independent, the newly independent countries achieved that, they were nowhere near independent. They were still just as dependent on a global financial and economic system that is designed to extract wealth out of their areas and bring it to the rich areas. And even when it is a domestic Kenyan company that's doing well, uh, they have an incentive to send their money to a New York bank or to a Swiss bank, besides just the, the possibilities of tax avoidance. Uh, it's still, uh, this is called the Lucas Paradox, the famous economist uh, Robert Lucas looked at, why is it that all the money goes from poor countries to rich countries? And then it's pretty obvious, because the higher rate of return and safety is in rich countries. Uh, and also because there are rich people, rich American companies who take their money out and send it to, uh, send it back home to repatriate their profits, et cetera. So just stop the draining of wealth, stopping all the barriers that the United States and the European Union have to African agriculture. Uh, Africa could be, a, you know, they have a comparative advantage in agriculture. They have an absolute advantage in agriculture. Uh, yet, for them to compete uh, on the international market, uh, there are so many hurdles, so many of them just have to be there just to make it a difficult task. Uh, it's, you know, I, I showed my students a documentary on banana production, uh, and the size, width, length of a banana has to meet EU standards, because if they're shorter, they're just not safe for Europeans to, to eat. Now, I know psychologists can go to town on this issue, but it just, <laughs> it seems to me that a lot of these rules are just designed to make it hard uh, as a way to protect your farmers. Now, you need to protect your agricultural system, but you need to protect it in a way that doesn't harm other countries' agricultural system. I mean, we subsidize our farmers to grow too much food so we can get, dump it on the world market that undermines the rest of the, uh, the third the growing, the developing countries, farmers, their ability to be profitable. You know, it, it would be better if we just paid our farmers to play solitaire on their computers uh, every other year as a way to keep our balance for not, for keep the United States from not making too much, growing too much corn in particular years. And of course, just the tax avoidance. And then there was a, Dutch historian, I believe, who at the at Davos uh, created a great stir when he said, uh, well, let's stop beating around the bush. The issue is taxes. And he said, this is like being at a fireman's convention and we're not allowed to talk about water. Uh, yeah, just, you need to have a successful, efficient government to have any chance at development. They, you need someone who can fix the roads, educate people, keep a decent amount of law and order, uh, and you just starve them of the ability to do that by all these ways of avoiding taxes, uh, tax payments, not just in rich countries, but in poor countries where they really cannot afford that. I would also suggest we <laughs> take seriously this concept of the ecological debt, uh, I believe that the rich countries should pay money to the poor countries regardless of any effect, just because the rich countries need to pay more than they need to receive. 
to understand the imbalance that has been here and, and to try to rectify it. Rectify it. And I think we have six countries that have met their uh, foreign aid commitments. Ireland got close to it before the crash, and now they're way down. The group I work for is trying to put pressure on, uh, no, is putting pressure on them to try to get back to hitting 0.7% of GDP. Uh, but this is not a major imposition on governments. Uh, a slight reduction in world military budgets would more than fund uh, all the development programs you could think of. Uh, you know, so it is, it, it's, in terms of reallocating resources, it's not that complicated. But in terms of reallocating resources, it's really complicated because of the ownership and control of the resources. But I think that uh, I'm hopeful because these are the dominant voices working in development. They've taken over much of the World Bank. Eventually, they'll take over uh, the IMF. Uh, and they're setting the academic agenda. Uh, and they're influencing uh, policy. Uh, not as much as we would hope, but that's the direction. And I think a lot of it comes down to this push to look at humans as more than uh, rational economic man. So just recovering from what you learned in your economics 101 class. And that's what I'm here for. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie. And uh, the floor is open for questions. I'd invite you to use the microphones. We have one on each side here. And also on the second level, there's one on each end. Um, that will help us with the recording. Thank you. Hi, Professor Clark. My name is Marcus Mesher. I'm from Xavier University. I really appreciated your presentation this morning. Thank you so much. So my question, uh, in light of what you've shared with us, is how do we make progress toward this vision of what it means to be human and the common good when right now we're living in an era of economic nationalism? Well, I think a re-election of Donald Trump will kill any desirability of nationalism once and for all, for all human history. But that's probably too much, to, too much of a risk. Uh, well, actually, I think the anxiety uh, and anger that brought us Donald Trump and brought us this nationalism is because so many people have been left out of this huge, prosperous uh, economy. And you know, they see around them all these developments. They hear on the news how great Wall Street's doing. They look at the coasts, and things are going well there, and they're being excluded. Uh, so I think the, the issues that drove Bernie Sanders' uh, supporters as well as uh, Trump's were this inequality caused by an economy that only benefits a small number of people. Uh, the problem with the, the, the nationalism is the scapegoating, sca scapegoating of immigrants and, and poor people in other countries and just uh, blaming them for the problems instead of the, uh, the, the overall system. And you know, a lot of it goes back to the financial crisis, that you know, the bankers never were made to pay for it. Uh, and they were just successfully able to switch it to that somehow this invasion from Mexico was the problem. Uh, you would hope that uh, this not improving their lives at some point, uh, those who support this economic nationalism, well, the base will become less supportive. It will not pay back. I mean, hopefully we can do this without, you know, Germany eventually learned the cost by being bombed into the Stone Age. Uh, that, you know, that this won't lead to war. But economic nationalism often leads to war. Uh, it's actually the oldest economic philosophy of mercantilism. It's my country versus your country. Of uh, Economics is just a br another branch of military conflict. Uh, and so hopefully that, that can be adverted. Uh, but you really have to, you know, I think 
engage people who have been left behind in a way that they see that it's not people who are worse off than you that are the fault, that are the blame, uh, that this is, the system is designed to produce inequality. It's not an accident. Yes. Uh, Bob King uh, from here, uh, from the uh, International Academy of Quality. Um, I was so thrilled to see in your talk the word eradicate uh, poverty, uh, because I am so excited about what the United Nations has done with the Sustainable Development Goals to, to raise the possibility of actually eliminating poverty. Uh, and as I look at the community we live in in South Bend, Indiana, with 40% uh, poverty, um, I know how difficult that challenge that is. Uh, so my question for you is, uh, are we trying to put new wine into old wineskins in our uh, colleges and universities that are meeting here? Um, can the courses that we current teach, currently teach uh, provide the understanding of the complexity and the elimination of the contradictions um, that will need to happen if we're going to eradicate poverty? Um, and, and do you see uh, any opportunities or, or lights in terms of universities looking to move their courseware to new areas that are currently not taught, except in very uh, specialized elite universities, um, to help expand the, the, the possibility of eradicating poverty. Thank you. Uh, in a previous life, I was an associate dean at a business school, uh, and it was a good lesson in how strong and rigid silos are in the academy. I mean, in my own work as an economist at St. John's, uh, most of my time is with the Vincentian Center for Church and Society, and everything that I've done and the people I interact with, all from different disciplines, uh, and only marginally do people consider me an economist, especially economists. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but once you start to try to start, once you start a conversation, or at least attempt to start a conversation on going beyond silos, to having, you know, uh, courses that have multiple instructors that try to look at uh, a business case from management and marketing at the same time, or to integrate course, course case studies across the discipline in terms of their second or third year, uh, that's when you realize that when we train people in, to get a, in graduate programs, when they get a PhD, uh, a good deal of that training is building the blinders. Because I'm gonna write a dissertation on you know, page seven of the general theory. I'm gonna look something very narrow. You don't wanna do something broad uh, for a dissertation. That was always the advice that you're given. I mean, I did mine on the influence of natural law theory and economics, so it was all over the place. But I was recommended to do something on the impact of currency changes on machine tool market shares in the 1980s, which is very narrow. And uh, by, by narrowing the focus, they just sort of build up this inability to see things beyond their own discipline, particularly after they graduate, then they then spend seven years getting tenure trying to show acceptance and reward from the narrowest part of their discipline, trying to get into those top journals, et cetera. Uh, and then it's only accidentally, after 10, 15 years, that either they become friends with someone or another department, they decide to do something together, or you get an administrator that says, you know, it'd be good if we looked at something in a multidisciplined way, that you start to see collaborations. When you do see them, it's very exciting. Uh, and there are many programs, particularly in business, because business is, you know, everything is, multi is interdisciplinary. I mean, it's ridiculous to say, I have an accounting degree, and then I'm gonna be useful anywhere. Uh, 
because I have to be able to speak to the marketing and the management. You, know, you have to be able to have a, a much more broader uh, perspective. But when, when you see the programs that do that, the students are just so excited by it because they're actively engaged in solving problems from all these different angles. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, for business schools, we have accreditation agency that tries to encourage that. But it's really, I think the problem is the narrow silos. I propose getting rid of all departments and just have a faculty of the business, and then you would have areas of expertise that would evaluate the quality of people's work. And they could be in any field, as long as they're experts in, in this issue. Uh, but obviously, that, they didn't make me dean and, and make that happen. <laughs> Hi, um, Patrick Clark, University of Scranton. It's a remarkable presentation, remarkably good, mm -hmm. uh, powerful, insightful. Um, my question's related to the last, in, in, in a way, it's a methodological question. Um, as a theologian, I have something of a uh, fear or ineptitude, maybe suspicion even, of um, the presumption that um, statistics and quantitative data, quantitative research will be able to uh, adequately address issues of uh, justice development, et cetera. Uh, but every time that I encounter somebody who's able to <laughs> properly uh, deal with the data and statistics, it's remarkably insightful. Um, so, but it seems as though y you also would agree that there is, at some point, goods, and maybe even conceptions of capital, that cannot be adequately captured through quantitative data. I, because of my background, tend to draw that line much sooner than I think I ought. I think much more could be shown through data, but it seems like even you would say at some point there are goods at stake in terms of human development that cannot simply be captured with numbers uh, and statistics and charts. The neoclassical mentality that you laid out there, it seems to me to almost have a presumption that if it cannot be captured through data, through charts, through math, then it's not really there and, and, and it can't really be uh, addressed and can't really be valued. Um, but it seems like so I guess my question is, at what point, where would you draw this line, and then how would you make that bridge or leap uh, to try to convince people? I'm not saying everybody even responds to statistics, but uh, how would you convince people who do only put stock in data and what can be quantified that there's something more at work here without simply then having them think, oh, well, they don't care about data? Yeah, the way I look at it is, is uh, you know, I have, many people have an iPhone that counts my steps. And if I go for a walk without my phone, did I walk? <laughs> no, because it's, it's not there. Uh, there is a wonderful line, which I, I have used in, in other presentations from uh, Pope Francis's address to the United Nations, uh, in which, because because the mission, we were big supporters of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, I, I actually wrote a, uh, a commentary on the, the indicators and recommendations for new ones or, you know, they, they, they sent out a questionnaire to, to different groups and I did one for the Holy See. Uh, so they're big supporters of this, but Pope Francis went out of his way to point out, you know, but these indicators are not people. And it's the people that matter. Uh, and we cannot allow ourselves to, be, to now fetishize over the indicators as if, you know, we, we don't use GDP. We now have sustainable development goal indicators and we'll just worship at that throne and just, because you can manipulate these, you know, if you want. And uh, particularly, you know, one of the oldest saying in, in statistics is there are lies, there's damnable lies, and then there's statistics. Uh, well, the, I actually am old enough to have read the book when it came out. Well, I don't know if it came out, but when I took statistics as an undergraduate, it was titled How to Lie with Statistics. Uh, but yeah, so I, I agree with you uh, that, that much of the story cannot be measured. Uh, uh, but I, I do think 
that evidence-based policymaking is very important uh, because ideologically-based policymaking is very dangerous. And we've had so many uh, implementation of policies that had no evidence based on it. I mean, we've caused many recessions in the United States because of the belief that expanding the money supply causes inflation. Uh, Friedman's evidence was only carried out with flexible legs, which means cheating. You know, that there isn't uh, any evidence. Uh, there's no evidence that the U U.S. Tr budget deficit is going to cause all the problems that everyone worries about. And the evidence suggests the exact opposite. Uh, but so I, I think it's important to try to get as much evidence as possible on any question that you're looking at. But you also need non-data people there. Particularly, you need people with the lived experience to inform what you're doing. Uh, instead of having you know, a bunch of data people like me go to an area and say, okay, here's your problem, here's the solution, it should be more like, we want to listen to you, have you determine what we're going to try to measure uh, how we're going to measure it, and then try to inform decisions that you want to make so that data becomes the servant instead of the master. But yes, it's, it's incredibly difficult, particularly because the people who are data people tend not to like to talk to people. <laughs> I got numbers. Why do I need to talk to all these people? Charlie, we have one more question here before okay. we wrap up. It's, it's a very short question. Actually, I'm Matthias Nebel from uh, Mexico, from the state of Puebla. Um, I'm wondering throughout all the, all, the, all the conference, something is missing. And the, the, what is missing is the state. You know, you're presupposing all along that the state exists. But actually, in most developing countries, you have more population than state. You have more territory than state. So that actually state, the state, the, the major agent you know, of economic development in a country is helpless. In Mexico, where I live, the informal economy is 60%, over 60%. means that the state has no control of this. And you have much more population than state. And it's not one of the state building, is not one of the items on your list here. So I'm wondering, is that intentional or is that just the elephant in the room that we are not looking at? Now, I can blame my poor hearing on the 60s or at least on the who. Uh, so I didn't catch everything, but I, I think you were talking about the, uh, the lack of effective states or governments in these countries. Is, yeah, okay, yeah. I can just, yeah, I'll just clarify. Um, he was asking about state building and noting that, for example, in Mexico, um, there is a large informal economy and uh, that we need to attend more to the reality of the state. Oh, yeah, well, actually, I, I, when I was working for the Irish government, it was when they were going into the Eurozone, and they were uh, discussing whether they should adopt the, the Euro. Uh, and there was a lot of discussions on Italy that, you know, you have economic statistics from Italy that everyone just said, well, we want Italy in because, you know, that's the one of the key areas of European history, but their economy is almost nothing in, in relation to the statistics of their economy. There's very little overlap. Uh, on paper, Italy is terrible, but if you live with an Italian for any amount of time, it's like, this is a nice place. They have a nice life. Uh, so they're a very big informal economy, and that's true of many places. And you don't necessarily, the informal economy doesn't necessarily mean the illegal economy, as you would have in many places in the United States. You know, a lot of it is just outside of market. It's related to family and connections and other sorts of networks 
that have worked for a very long time and been very successful. So you need a way to measure progress that is based on what works for different areas. Uh, however, you do need an effective government. I mean, the, the, the alternative to, to incompetent and corrupt governments is not no government. It's minimally competent and uh, minimally corrupt governments. I mean, you need to have referees, uh, you need to have basic public services that the, even Adam Smith pointed out, the market's never going to give you good roads, bridges and canals and schools. You need those basic functions that the market can never do. Uh, but there are areas where this, this could be more of an informal economy providing itself as opposed to necessarily having a national education system imposed on a whole area. I mean, the areas themselves should play a big role in this.